Our first speaker is Yuri Shevchuk. He has been lecturer of Ukrainian language here at Columbia University's Department of Slavic Languages since 2004. Uh, he has taught a Ukrainian at the Harvard University Summer School for many, many years. He holds a PhD in uh, Germanic philology and MA in political science. His research is focused on language and colonialism, as you will see, and the role of cinema in identity formation. He authored Beginner's Ukrainian with Interactive Online Workbook, a popular textbook for university students and independent learners worldwide. One of the first books in many, many years in English to teach the Ukrainian language. Um, Dr. Shachuk has been a guest lecturer at leading U.S., Canadian, Italian, Spanish, Polish, and Ukrainian universities. His current project is the pioneering Ukrainian English Collocations Dictionary, which will be published next year. We're looking forward to that. As the founding director of the Ukrainian Film Club here at Columbia University, the only permanent forum of Ukrainian film outside Ukraine, uh, Shevchuk has actively promoted Ukrainian cinema in the West and argued in his publications in the Ukrainian press, radio, and TV for the need of a national filmmaking as the core element of post-colonial Ukrainian identity. He's a member of the National Filmmakers Union of Ukraine and the Ukrainian National Film Academy. And today, uh, the title of his talk is Shell Shocked, Ukrainian Cinema Facing the Realities of Russian Aggression. Yuri. Thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you for coming to this very important conference when we were discussing the concept of the conference, uh, we all agreed that uh, the other war that has been waged in and around Ukraine, and I, that, by that I mean the cultural war, the war that's waged uh, against Ukraine on the cultural front, uh, has not gotten enough attention, by far nowhere near enough. And this conference was supposed to kind of uh, compensate for that void. Uh, and uh, pro problematize a number of very important issues, including uh, cinema, how cinema and filmmaking has been uh, uh, weaponized against Ukraine, but also, most uh, importantly, as part of this conference, how it has been used to, as, a, uh, as a means of uh, mobilizing Ukrainian society to repel uh, foreign Russian aggression. Uh, I'm going to talk about a central issue that I think is for Ukrainian filmmaking as it reacts to Russian aggression, and that issue is that of identity. What it means to be Ukrainian. Uh, what, why Ukra what kind of a hero, what kind of a protagonist Ukrainian film articulates as a kind of rallying point for the viewer a point of solidarity, a point of uh, political mobilization. And I'm going to analyze two films that I think are in many ways paradigmatic because each of them represents a particular paradigm, a particular point of view of Ukrainian identity. And I'm going to try and do it against a briefly outlined historical context so that we know what's going on uh, kind of diachronically it, uh, from the point of view of his history. And I'm going to try and juggle three things here, this, that, and this, because uh, technology sometimes makes your life more complicated rather than easier. So Ukrainian identity on screen, perhaps the first and the most influential instance of its articulation belongs to Alexander Dovzhenko, the person whose oeuvre and whose precedent is very much with us and still very much emulated as a model. And Dovzhenko, in his silent trilogy, uh, where he, get, he ha had a relatively uh, wide uh, freedom of expression that later was, uh, had been taken away from him, he articulates a Ukrainian identity that is uh, nothing short of revolutionary. Uh, and uh, and uh, I just wanted to reiterate, he rejects the imperial stereotype of Ukrainianness as provincial and antithetical to modernity. Ukrainian identity is urban and most importantly is revolutionary. That is the identity that has a future and that has a capacity to appeal to 
the next, to the young, to the coming generation. And the carrier of that identity primarily is the character of Timish, who appears for the first time in Zvenehora, then in Arse uh, Arsenal. And in Arsenal, for instance, we, we see him in a scene when uh, uh, a representative of the Central, uh, Central Council, Ukrainian bourgeois government, uh, independent, asks him, who are you? And, uh, and trying to suggest that he, are you Ukrainian, Russian? He rejects being classified as Ukrainian and responds, I'm a worker. And a lot of critics uh, or historians say that he refuses to be classified in national terms. My interpretation is that he refuses to be classified in imperial national terms because at that time being Ukrainian was tantamount to being a peasant, a person belonging in museum. Towards the end of the film, when he is about to be shot by uh, the troops of Central Narada, he rises and to the question, the same question reiterated to him, he says, Ukrainian worker. And that to me is an act of synthesis of a reinvented Ukrainian, Ukrainian identity in both in ethnic terms and in social terms. A modern, an act of modernization, an act of breaking away from the imposed imperial stereotype of Ukrainian identity as such that has no future. Uh, Okay, let's move on, shall we? So let, let's see how he, uh, I'll try, okay. This is the, this is the clip where, where Timish runs out of, uh, of bullets, uh, stop who, who are you? And he, knowing that he cannot shoot back any longer, he kind of rises up proudly and says, Ukrainian, worker, shoot. And shoot they do, but they can't kill him. Because that new identity is indestructible. It proves to be indestructible. And they say something that will echo in another film. Has he put on armor? Remember that, that, that theme, because it will surface later in my presentation. And he says, well, no armor, as you see. It's just the indestructible identity that he had acquired towards the end of that <coughs> film. OK, let's move on. Dovzhenko doesn't stop there. We're talking about his silent films, where language is, by definition, absent. Now, in his first talking film, Ivan, Dovzhenko does something remarkable. He presents the Ukrainian language as a shibboleth of modern Ukrainian identity. Dovzhenko insists on making the film in Ukrainian, not Russian, actually lying to authorities that the reason being not because he's such a nationalist, rabid nationalist f fixated on Ukrainian, but simply because he can't find Rus Ukrainian Russian-speaking actors in Kyiv, which was not true. It was probably a hundred times easier to find Russian-speaking actors than Ukrainian at that time. He makes Ukrainian the language of all walks of life in that film, from the most humble peasant uh, felled to the construction of the Dnipro hydropower station, to engineer, to student, to workers all the way up to the highest party officials. The entire Ukrainian society speaks that new language. Uh, he associates Ukrainian with progress and modernization, and he does something quite even more remarkable. Dovzhenko presents Russian, the language of the colonizer, as a mark of narrow-minded bourgeois philistinism. And that's, let's see if I can get away with another clip. So this is a conversation bet, uh, be, uh, between two people. One is demanding to, to tune the radio to Zagranitsa, to, and she speaks Russian, and she comes across as this Philistine. Her partner speaks Ukrainian, and he wants, and he <coughs> insists on the value of things Ukrainian. Let's see if we, if we can, if we can, okay. Oh, 
Ai, não mexe na moça. Acho que não tem medo. Acho que nasce. Não vou lá, não sou mim. Mas não é impossível. Cada um para o disco, rádio estante. Cada um para o disco. Cada um se lhe esbudoímo. Não se vê que está por aí. Замолчите вы! Сало 15 масло 16! There. Uh, so, jumping uh, almost a century ahead, uh, what is Ukrainian in post-Soviet Ukrainian film? Basically, two variations of uh, the view of Ukrainian identity uh, uh, can be easily discerned. One is geographically conditioned, a hybrid notion of Ukrainian identity. Uh, and I asked uh, once during a press conference a highly influential director of the Molodies Film Festival, Andrei, Andrei Halpakchi, can you tell me what you consider, uh, what films you consider to be Ukrainian? And his answer was beautifully simple, quote, all films that are made on the territory of Ukraine are thus Ukrainian films, end quote. Geographically conditioned notion of identity allows to present Ukraine on screen as depopulated of Ukrainians, russified and cleansed of any signs of Ukrainianness. The way Ukraine very often comes across in films by Kira Muratova, uh, who is still uh, very often said to be a Ukrainian film director, uh, Eva Neyman, Alexander Shapiro, Roman Balayan, and a number of others. It's really paradigmatic. The second uh, view of Ukrainian identity is, I call it conventional notion, uh, which emphasizes on Ukrainian story in the film, Ukrainian talent, Ukrainian viewer, and the Ukrainian language. And it builds on and continues Dovzhenko's tradition, both under the Soviet occupation, because that understanding of Ukrainian identity was able to kind of articulate, although in a, a very constricted, limited, uh, uh, kind of scale, and after 1991, uh, in uh, the works of the uh, Ilyenko brothers, Yanchuk, Sanyin, and a number of others. The independent short film project that uh, emerged, uh, I think, in uh, uh, two, uh, 2012, called Arabeski the Jerks, or they sometimes use the, the word fuckers, which is a wrong translation of mudaki, but, but officially they translated it in English, actually as a matter of program proclaimed that kind of view, view of identity. Quote, we film here, now, and about ourselves. So going to uh, our, the object of our analysis, two films, Cyborgs, Kiborhi, uh, directed by Artem Seytablayev and Atlantis, uh, directed by Valentin uh, Vasyanovich. Cybergs, sorry for the spelling mistake, Heroes Never Die, I just wanted to, if anybody noticed that, based on real life, it's based on a real life story of the siege laid to the Donetsk airport by Russian troops, Chechen mercenaries and Ukrainian collaborationists. Conceived as a blockbuster with the widest possible national and international viewership in mind, it uh, had a budget of $1.7 million, supposedly the largest ever in post-Soviet Ukrainian filmmaking. It used professionally trained actors. Uh, it has long-winded and often moralistic dialogues about patriotism, <coughs> enemy, identity. It extols heroism and often uh, openly propagandistic. National theatrical release, it had all around the place, all around Ukraine. And uh, it was released on December 7th, 1917. And then there was a four-part television version of it. And it enjoyed a considerable box office uh, success. A cumulative worldwide gross, uh, you can read that. So Tablaev, in his interview, that's important to know, to, uh, TV to the OnePlus One TV channel says, quote, Cybergs 
is a war film about identity, about what it means to be Ukrainian, and who is Ukrainian and who is not, end quote. Seytablayev instructed his actors that he was making a film not about war, but about peace, about the country in which we all dream to live, end quote. Identity is front and center in cyborgs. Cyborgs is unpatriotic, why is it? And criticizing cyborgs, it became such an orth of orthodoxy the way cyborg presented war and everything that to have any problems with that was considered to be unpatriotic. If you look at comments, people would be, who would be critical of cyborgs would be immediately attacked by others as, as lack, lacking in patriotism. Atlantis, in many ways, is the opposite of cyborgs. It's an art house film for discerning and serious viewer meant for international festival run. Based on a fictional story, a collected kind of, kind of mini stories of others, uh, it uses non-professional actors. People actually play themselves. The veteran is the veteran. The coroner is a corona. The, the corona, the, uh, the, uh, uh, a participant of a volunteer organization looking for uh, the fallen uh, uh, soldiers is what she is in the real life. It's intensely intimate and it has a very personal tonality. No grand claims, no heroics, no quasi-philosophical pronouncements, emphatically quotidian modality of narration. First prize, it won, it immediately became a huge international success and we fell victim to its success because we planned to show it tonight. I had a, an agreement with the, with the producer and the director of the film, then it got, uh, its uh, screening rights were sold internationally. I had to renegotiate it and they said, first the festival run and then Columbia University. So eventually we will show it because the director is a long time member of the Columbia University Film Club. We showed all of his films starting with his student films and we are very proud that one of our members is now talked about. As I speak, the film is being screened at the Tokyo Film Festival. It won the highly prestigious Horizonte first prize, the second most prestigious at the, at the International Film Festival in Venice. It was part of the co uh, official competition at Toronto Film Festival. Uh, at Hamburg, it's, go, it's going to Sevilla and a number of others. It's slated for limited theatrical release in Ukraine in early 2020, hasn't been yet released. And uh, the director told me in his interview with me uh, that he ex expects at best 10,000 viewers will see the film in Ukraine. No great expectations, even for the film that is uh, kind of internationally celebrated. So Ukrainian identity in cyborgs, it's hybridized mixture of Ukrainian and Russian traits. Ukrainian plays a decorative function in it. Russian senses, ways, values, messages, stereotypes of Ukrainians and language occupy the dominant position. There are two levels of signification. Outward is Ukrainian, programmatic is Russian. Outwardly, Ukrainian identity is signified by visual cues that are thematized. This is thematically flagged by all kinds of camera movements, by positioning them in the frame, and so on and so forth. The cue, already? Uh, the cues include, uh, okay, I, I will just jump on. So Russian content is dominant in the film. Film title starting with the film title. That's the, uh, an occasion when Ukrainians identi identify themselves via the colonizer. The very name Cybergs, uh, there is a, an apocryphal story that it was uh, listened uh, or intercepted a Russian uh, communication between Russian militaries and the sieging forces said that these people are indestructible. Did they put on their armor? They are like cyborgs. So Ukrainians picked that up, that designation that was actually Russian, and assumed it as their own self-vision. And that mechanism of borrowing the colonizer's description of your own self works all the time. Another such example is the ukrop, 
which is also coined by Russians and kind of switched by Ukrainians and turned into a badge of honor. And uh, even President Poroshenko said that ukrop really doesn't mean dill, a plant that Russians uh, were trying to kind of dehumanize Ukrainians, reducing them to a plant, but it's it's actually ukrainska ukrainski opir. It's a it's a blend from two words: Ukrainian resistance, ukrop, ukrainski or. Uh, so another another such uh, mecha this mechanism is incredibly productive, also self-identification as Bandera, as the title of the film, the code name Banderas, a play on Antonio Banderas and a Banderivets. Bandera is also inherently Russian, a label for a Ukrainian. Uh, and on and on and on. Uh, Russian narrative of war in cyborgs, the enemy in cyborgs is the Separ or pejorative of separatist. A Ukrainian citizen who fights against his own country and sides with and, and is supported by Russia. Separ is used at least 10 times in the film. You see Separs usually when the enemy is talked about. Russian soldier appears only once. And that, as a likable, if deceived by Moscow propaganda, denizen of the Vladimir province, Zolotoy Kalto Rasi, uh, and found himself in Ukraine killing Ukrainians almost by misunderstanding. It's almost difficult not to sympathize with the, pu with the poor guy as you see him presented in such a way in that film. The virtual absence of Russian enemy promotes the idea that what is going on is an internal Ukrainian conflict, a civil war, and not an aggression. Uh, the Russian aggression is further obfuscated by the acronym ATO, anti-terrorist operation, which is used high and low across the board, everywhere, always, in ref instead of Russian aggression against Ukraine, by Ukrainians themselves. Uh, so squad commander Subota is, instead of motivating his soldiers, he seems to be going out of his way trying to confuse them about the enemy and gives them a very strange motivational speech. Quote, we are fighting not only with the Russians and the Kadyrov's men, but our Ukrainians as well. That is horrible. We must think how it all happened. Who is to blame? We must study and know history, analyze our mistakes. We are here, the means we agree to pay for our past, defend the present, and assume responsibility for the future. The commander voices the idea of, the, uh, of that twice, as if to confuse them even further. Uh, I will jump the illustration. Russian machismo in cyborgs. Uh, so Ukrainian soldiers, including those who speak Ukrainian, repeatedly describe themselves as muziki, muzik, which is a Russian word. And it's strange that a Ukrainian think of themselves in Russian terms, whereas Ukrainian has more than enough words to denote manliness and virile courage and all, all of that. But that's what they do in the film, interestingly enough. Uh, there are other specifically Russian cliches like uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, let's go on. The language in cyborgs also has this hierarchical distribution. Uh, Russian is high language with prestigious symbolic capital. Uh, it is attractive. Ukrainian is low and devoid of symbolic capital, not attractive, and it is used as it is used in cyborgs. Russian is pure, no loans from Ukrainian, and naturally colloquial. Ukrainian is either stilted or unnatural or hybridized and peppered with Russian. Russian is self-sufficient. No Russian speaker ever switches to Ukrainian for love or money, with the exception of some mocking quotations. When they quote Ukrainians, they would just say that Ukrainian word. Ukrainians switch to Russian all the time. Uh, Russian-speaking characters, OK, I did that. Let's go on. The stereotypes Ukrainians are presented uh, in cyborgs very nicely correspond with the historical imperial stereotypes of Ukrainians that are outlined by Austrian historian uh, Andreas Kapeller. Uh, they are Mazepists, they are Little Russians, and they are Chacholes.
the dominant stereotype of Ukrainian is that of little Russian. Uh, somebody who uh, has no, uh, who doesn't see his identity as profoundly different from great Russian identity, for whom the language uh, doesn't have essential difference, and the war is really something that divides them temporarily. They see themselves as a kind of a variety, south southwestern variety of the great Russian culture. There's also a typical stereotype of Ukrainian who is a chachol, who is who, is, uh, who has no agency of his own, no culture of his own, and no language of his own. He speaks uh, uh, a mixture of Russian and Ukrainian. He is uh, despised and mocked uh, by the carrier of uh, little Russian identity. I wanted uh, you to see this clip. So there is a conversation, Russian-speaking character Heed uh, is bragging about having sex with a Russian woman from Moscow at, in this place in Donetsk airport during the, the peaceful time, and he says uh, uh, that they drank whiskey there, and the Chachol tells, who, whose name is Starei, uh, uh, asks him, whiskey is some kind of cognac, right? And he uh, mockingly, what small town are you from? And he goes, uh, he responds, I am from Mirhorod, it's a city. And uh, he uh, and you never tasted whiskey? And study, we have mineral water, 60% proof in every kitchen, as if going out of his way to reinforce the Russian imperial stereotype of Ukrainians as vodka, swigging, dancing, and singing tribe. Now, let's try and, and watch it. Под столом виски разливали. Культурные люди. Или? Ага. Виски, это такой коньяк по цвету. Старый, ты вообще из какого пакета? Я из Миргорода, это город. И виски не пробовал. У нас минеральная вода, 60 градусов на каждой кухне. Окей, да. So Atlantis is, uh, presents an alternative in terms of the identity it articulates. It follows the conventional concept of Ukrainian identity and builds on what's on the precedent set by Dovzhenko. The events, uh, I won't tell you what, what the film is about. Uh, Ukraine and Ukrainians in the film free themselves from the Russian domination. The, the action takes place in 2025. The war with Russia has been won, but Ukraine, Donbass occupied by Russia, is an environmental catastrophe. And that Russians disappear. There are no Russians to be seen. There is no Russian language to be heard and no hint of Russian culture. The only thing Russian that remains are echoes of the past and the catastrophe that they caused in Donbass. That's the kind of uh, post-colonial transcendence, the, the kind of a victory over uh, colonial legacy that the other film seems to be reinforcing, legitimizing, and normalizing. So, uh, just to, uh, as, a, as a conclusion, uh, Cyborgs present the dominant view of Ukrainian identity supported both by Poroshenko and Zelensky government and the Ukrainian oligarchic media today. Many other recent war films recycle the ideological points articulated by Cyborgs, such as colonial self-vision, <sighs> hybridized Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian identity, moral ambivalence of fighting Russian aggression, Russian narrative of events as a civil war, Ukrainian culture as insufficient and incomplete without the culture of the colonizer. Cybergs offer a Ukrainian identity that is Ukrainian in form and Russian in meaning. It is, in essence and logic, such a, an identity is neo-colonial. Atlantis offers the Ukrainian identity that is constructed on Ukrainian terms, modern, self-sufficient, if deeply traumatized, and post-colonial in essence. Cybergs accepts the colonial status quo, affirms and normalizes colonizers' hegemony in Ukraine. Atlantis rejects the status quo, displaces and eliminates the colonizer. In Cyborgs, Ukrainians win the moral war with the colonizer and lose the civilizational war, disappearing in the colonizer. In Atlantis, the colonizer is defeated both militarily and at the level of senses, values, and culture. 
Cybergs forever locks Ukrainians into a false dialogue with the colonizer where all conclusions and outcomes are predetermined to favor the colonial narrative. Atlantis gives the Ukrainian narrative a new and powerful voice, both within Ukraine and in the world. And this is a quotation from one of the Italian film critics and filmmakers who, who helped publicize the film at Venice Film Festival. This is his letter to me and uh, copied to uh, Valentin Vasyanovich where he emphasizes the universal philosophical appeal of the film. This is uh, Davide Grieco uh, uh, and he is now uh, talking at this uh, he is on, uh, on this side talking with his friend Bernardo Bertolucci uh, before uh, Bernardo Bertolucci died. And he writes, quote, Ukraine can represent all the world thanks to a film like this. A world where the war takes the place of the work generated by the lack of work and everything seems terribly insane because what's left or whatever dictatorship of the, of the last century is totally inane. All right, thanks. Thank you can you read the rest yourself. <laughs>